Uh, here we go. Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, Grant Friedman with Next to the Text, and today I am with digital artist and photographer Eric Johansson. And Eric uh, has done work with companies including Adobe, Google, Microsoft, Volvo, and National Geographic, but you probably know him from his personal work. Um, Eric, uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with me today, and I, I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So I guess the first, I guess you know, for people who aren't familiar with your work, I, I thought I would um, show everybody some of your past pieces, which are um, just amazing. So uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick, and we're just going to open up Lightroom and. Just go through a few a few of uh, my faves. So let's take a look. Can you see my screen now? Let's see. Yes, I can. Yeah. Um. So here we go. We've got this is this is this piece has been around for a while now. Uh, so I you know I've I think we've interviewed a couple times in the past, mm -hmm. and we've definitely talked about this piece. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us? Can you tell um, some of our viewers who may not have seen this one before? Can you tell them a little bit more about this piece? Yeah, this is something I did for I think it was five years ago in 2009, um, and I wanted to do a picture with a fish and an island. I somehow wanted to to make something um, with a Swedish landscape, but it would be something different underneath. So. Uh, I made this, uh, I mean, this picture con uh, con consists of different parts from different places. So the fish was photographed on uh, a fishing trip. Uh, the island was from one other place in Gothenburg. The house was from a different place and the shores from a different place. And uh, the underwater part was photographed in the stone pit. So uh, yeah, it's a quite good example of, of the kind of work I do. It's, a lot of collecting material from different places and then putting it together in Photoshop. Yeah, I know that you did a, uh, a layer breakdown in your presentation at Adobe Max last, mm -hmm. not this time, but the last time before that. Uh, did you do a behind the scenes with this one at all? I didn't, no. Uh, behind the scenes videos is something that I started doing a couple of years ago just to show people the amount of work that it actually is behind a lot of these pieces. But uh, back then, I didn't really think about it. But now I try to do at least two behind-the-scenes videos each year. Yeah, I think those are really cool. I think they really add a lot to. Um, I know you put in a lot of work into your pieces, and I think I think showing exactly how much work actually goes into those pieces, I think, really helps people understand. Like, wow, this you know this you know this guy didn't just like throw this together. Like, this took a lot of planning, a lot of effort. Yeah, I think it's like a lot of fun. I mean, I, I really enjoy watching other people's behind the scenes uh, videos. So I thought that maybe people could be interested in uh, interested in the way I work as well. So. so this next one here, let's take a look. The next piece is this is one I think you actually did a behind the scenes uh, video on, right? I did. Yeah, they are all a little bit different, all the behind the scenes uh, videos, and this was actually. Basically, uh, just a seven-minute uh, time lapse of all the work I did in Photoshop with this piece. Uh, sped, I mean, uh, but about I think 80 times the normal speed. So it's pretty intense to watch, I think. But I wanted to show the actual process of actually creating this picture and the amount of hours I put into this work. Yeah, and I, if I remember that this piece was like you, the 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 fold was actually a piece of. Um, paper that you had photographed, right? Yeah, to me, I mean, putting, creating these images, it's basically about problem solving. I mean, I always start with a very simple sketch and then I need to find a way how to actually get there. And that's usually by photographing different, pla uh, different places, different things, using different materials to try to help me how it would actually behave. I mean, something like this would be pretty hard to actually find. Yeah. So that's why, uh, I mean, for this piece, I, I used a piece of paper that I cut, and I just folded it this way. And I photographed it, and then I could photograph the landscapes that I needed and basically put it on top of the paper model that I made. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember you, I think one of the, during your Adobe Max presentation, I think one of the things that really stuck with me about that was, like, 
was you had kind of casually mentioned uh, not to rely on stock photography, you know, to go out and shoot it yourself. And I think that's like really important if you're looking to create, because uh, I know a lot of people look at your work and they say, wow, I want to create something like that. And so they try to create mm -hmm. something like that. But I think one of the issues with it is that if you're not going out and shooting your own photography, I think you're going to have trouble creating work um, you know, at a in the same quality as 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 you, as you do. Yeah, I think I mean that's something that I discovered quite early. That I mean, stock photography can be great sometimes if you can't really travel to a certain place and you need that kind of uh, pictures. But the problem is, I mean, if you want to put together pictures to make it look realistic, then they all need to have the same perspective and the same light. And uh, usually, that's not something that you find in stock photography. Um, so. That's why I started to photograph. So I, I started learning Photoshop f at first, and then I learned that I had to photograph to to just collect the material I need to to create these pictures. Yeah, I think that when you when you have a when you go into a um, a, a project and you have like a, a solid plan, and I think most of your your projects usually start out as a sketch, and then you go out and you create the assets, and then you. Um, you know, then you start working on it in Photoshop, and yeah. if you start off and you have a plan like that. I think that that it, um, it it's you save so much time um, as opposed to if you kind of had a general idea and then you went searching through stock sites and looking for mm -hmm. um, you know stock photography and then um, started to. Um, because I think one of the, one of the problems that you have when you work with stock is that to make it look realistic, you have to put so much time into changing the light, changing the perspective, yeah. you know, fixing shadows and things like that. And when, whereas when you go out and you shoot your own photography, you don't you don't necessarily have to do all that. Yeah, it's it's also for me that, that that it's a way for me to get away from the computer as well. I mean, I spend a lot of time in front of the computer with all the photoshopping, with all the composing and everything. But I mean, some things maybe they could be made in post as well. But I mean, it's more fun to actually build something or make something with your hands as well. And I think that's also like part of the process to actually see how something behaves. And if you actually make it for real, uh, it will look realistic. Yeah. Otherwise, you would have to guess what it would look like if you actually would make it. In this next piece, that I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Um, this next piece was like one of my favorites. I always loved this one that you that you had done. Let's see. Yeah. This is a pretty good example of of just that. I think. I mean, with uh, making something for real. Yeah. And you did a you did a behind the scenes video of this one too, right? I actually didn't do video, but there is uh, a little bit of. Uh, uh, I made a blog post post about it because I didn't think about it at the time to actually record material for it. But I did shoot some behind the scenes material of it, so there are some stills showing how I how I made it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, and I think yeah, I remember reading that blog post. It was really cool because you, you talked about because weren't you you were holding like an aquarium or something right like that right and you were, that's how you were getting that effect of pouring the water out um, yeah and then you so actually yeah it was very important to me to actually make this effect look realistic that the water would come out of the painting and the best way to do that is to actually pour water out of the painting so I just got this very cheap frame from a second-hand store, uh, and I built a small container behind the frame out of uh, cardboard and uh, duct tape and some plastic bags and stuff, super simple, and it took me maybe 30 minutes to build or something. And I could fill it up with water, and I could pour water out of it. So That's really cool. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's what's cool. And how did you, did you, did you take that, did you have an assistant taking that photo? while you were holding that or was that did you have like some remote trigger that you were using actually, no it's, it's remote trigger. actually that's not me in the picture I'm taking the picture but no. uh, but uh, yeah so but I had I used the remote trigger for the or um, for the flash inside the where you see the Sun in the picture that's actually flashed in there also as well taped to the top of the of the inside of the of the container and and those ships that were those are those real ships or is those toy ships 
They are, it's, it's actually mixed. The, the ship in the foreground, that's a real ship. The ship coming out of the painting is also a real ship. Uh, and the third ship too. Then the, the bigger ship in the back, that's actually a toy ship. But it's slightly out of focus, so you don't really see it. Even on the big print, you don't really see that it's a fake ship. Uh, and also, I kind of like that the mixture of fake and real ships, and you don't really know which one is which. And uh, yeah, yeah, just a, this was just a really solid piece. So I really, really loved looking at that one. Um, let's just take a look at the next one. What do we have here? We've got this is one I've never seen this one before, and I look at this portfolio a lot. I've never seen this one. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward picture. It's, it's more, it's not that much retouching in this one. I just found this really cool location uh, with the like ice breaking up in in winter time. I think it was February or something last year, and uh, it was basically just I shot a lot of shot, a lot of uh, I took a lot of photographs at the place at the location, and then I basically just looked through everything, and I thought like yeah, this could actually even be a picture, even even like this. So I just put some houses and stuff in there that I thought could be interesting, and even these small animals there. Uh, so yeah. there's like separation between two people. Uh, the house is breaking up, and also like there's this little little an animal there, and then there's another one to the left there. Now, were these animals in the original shot, or were they? Um, they were not in the original shot, but I I shot them. At on the way back from this place, actually, I saw them out on the field. So it was actually shot at the same, you know, like it, within just a couple of hours. I love doing that when but you. The scale of the place is actually a lot smaller than it looks here. I mean, here it looks like these giant blocks of ice, but uh, in reality, the blocks are a lot smaller. I mean, if a person would be standing on a cliff where the house would be. The person would be about three times higher than the house. So, <laughs> so this is kind of like a close-up shot. This isn't so the scale. Of this is not quite what we. Um, right. It's like kind of close-up. Yeah. The so, ice. Uh, the ice. Is cool. a, yeah, I think it's a quite efficient way of doing. I mean, if some places when you shoot some places, it just looks like if you remove some objects, it's really hard to say. Uh, I mean, the kind of scale you have in the, in the picture, what, what the perspective is. And you can play around with it by putting like small, smaller things in there. Make it look so, bigger. so is this ice that builds up on the rocks? Yeah, yeah. It was like really windy, so the ice was being pushed up on the, on the shore. And, and uh, yeah, that's when I photographed. And I, I just liked the kind of shape that you got here. And to me, that was very interesting. So cool, yeah, definitely. So let's take a look. What else? What else do we have here? We've got this one. This is this is a this one was amazing. I mean, this one I thought um, I remember when, when I saw it for the first time and I watched the 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 video for it. It's just like it's just so well executed. And it, not only that, I, I thought it just had so many so many different meanings that mm -hmm. that it just like it it really you know it it just kind of spoke to me a little bit. Yeah, I was. Uh, I I didn't think that it would turn out exactly like this, but it turned out really well. I was very lucky with the weather and uh, and with the different parts. I think and I had the very basic idea of what I wanted to create in the beginning, like a very just a bottle and and like some kind of village or someone living inside the bottle. But as I started to shoot the different material, it started to come together for me in, in my mind how I actually wanted to execute it. And it would be it became quite a lot darker than I thought it would be from the beginning. But I, it was quite, uh, yeah, I, I liked the result. I really love, like, the textures and the... Uh, one of my favorite parts is, is like, the, the, the sort of that glass, the sort of scratched... Um, glass look like you're looking out of a porthole of a ship. Um, yeah, yeah. Look I wanted, it was somehow it was a little bit too clean before, so I just wanted to make it a little bit more dirty. Somehow get the feeling of, of uh, I mean, the place where the people actually live, and maybe get that kind of feeling also uh, on the on the lens that it was photographed with. Yeah, I think it just adds so much. It adds that like I think a lot of uh, when I, when I look at a lot of pieces or you know from other artists and things I think one thing that I that I think a lot of what the difference between a a good piece of art and a great piece of art I think is the storytelling and mm -hmm. I think that that piece has like a lot of storytelling to it 
You know, it, mm-hmm. um, y- y- it looks like you're looking out of a porthole of a ship, and there's this there's this bottle floating by with with a kind of a rural town, rural city. You know, farming community might even look like that. You know, it's just and it's like, so what's the message in the bottle? You know, I think mm-hmm. it's what's so cool about that piece. Yeah. Um, so I think with the next one, what do we have? What else do we have next? So the next one is um, what w- what we kind of got together to talk about, which is this piece called Let's Leave. And I had seen this one in your portfolio, and I would actually um, had not seen it yet. So mm-hmm. um, just going to take a look at this really quick. I'll share my screen. Um, which is it's just a super cool piece. Let's see. Here we go. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Here, really, here we go. Yeah. So tell me, tell us a little bit about about this piece. Yeah. Um. I wanted to make something with bubbles. I I always think that they are. I mean, quite fascinating with this kind of rainbow pattern and, and color, all the colors and stuff that you have inside them. And I thought that, I mean, they just when you when you blow a bubble, you don't know really where it would go, and and it just disappears. It goes, it flies off, takes off, and then it just pops. And I thought somehow to me that 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 felt like, I mean, what if we could travel in bubbles? What if we could just and it will just take us. And anywhere we, I mean, we couldn't really control where to go. We would just be in a bubble and go away. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I thought it would just be interesting to try to do something uh, on that topic and like someone trying to leave the place and tr- someone trying to go somewhere else. It's such a detailed piece. I'm just sort of scanning through it and, and looking at it at 100% here, and it's it's so detailed. The uh, the uh, like this little like the little water splashes coming off of the side, yeah. the little bubbles dropping down, and the, I don't even know what you call it, the little thing that you blow the bubbles with. Um, I don't know. Yeah, bubble tube? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it's so detailed. I mean, it looks like... It's, I think most of the details, it's something that people won't see, really, but uh, that's it's really important to me to actually just work, uh, spend a lot of work on the details to actually be proud of seeing a big print of it and be sure that like it looks perfect. And what's so cool is that y- you were like really nice enough to send me some like sort of behind the scenes pictures with this as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I and has anybody ever seen any of this stuff before? Um, any of these b- other images? Uh, I, I think for for this one, no, this hasn't been shown uh, at all actually. I'm I'm a little bit like I. I, I want to show people how I make my pictures, but not all of them. I want to leave a little bit of magic in there as well. I don't know, like it's not really magic, but you know, I I, I like to keep people wondering sometimes. You know. Yeah, I mean. And I decided that I mean, when you asked me about this picture, I thought like, why not just show it to you? And and that's that would be the first time I ever show this picture how it's made, how it was and, made. And so we've got this this one right here is the sketch. Let's see, right here. Right. That was a very basic sketch that I that I made for. Uh, I, I thought it would be like something that maybe one person helping helping the other person um, into a bubble, and maybe one person is already on its way. And uh, I looked a lot at different bubbles on on the web just to see what, what what you could do with bubbles. And I found also this other picture with a with a guy inside a bubble. Uh, from one of my favorite photographers as well. Um, but I think that's a little bit different. So uh, yeah, I didn't want to, you know. <laughs> do you like to when you when you're planning out, you like to do you like to sketch things out, but do you also like to put like a mood board together as well? Sometimes I do, and actually for this one, uh, this sketch I made to show the the, the models in the picture, uh, uh, just to explain a little bit to them how I imagine it to be put together. But usually the sketches are really basic, like more like the one above there and, and there's like not really any mood boards. I just have like a, an idea in my mind and, and that's what I'm trying to capture. Um, so we've got this next picture here, um, which is, this is sort of like the, is this the, is this the, the raw unretouched Photo this or is this? Is more, uh, yeah, unretouched picture of this uh, of this image. And I already thought that I would have this kind of the bubble tool, uh, 
but in a bigger scale. But so I thought that it would be good to make something that would look a little bit similar to that. So I would know where to place it in perspective and everything. Yeah. So uh, like and it's also easier for her to to hold something you know that has a weight instead of just faking it and, and try to just hold something. So I think it's always good to to try to capture as much as possible and also gives a better like feeling of how it would actually be to do this. Was that like a a swimming pool net or something like that that she's holding? It was like it was a thing that I just built out of uh, like I found this pipe and I found like a ring and and it's just uh, put together very roughly with some tape and stuff and and uh, yeah I, I think something like that could have worked as well but I think this was a little bit bigger. I get so jealous of people that have the ability to make props. Um, you know. Uh, it's always very simple to me, but yeah, <laughs> I think in, it's a bit of basically anything. I, think. I always feel like that living in, in New York that I just have no capability to create, you know, to, to get a pipe and some... Yeah, you know, I know. And something I don't have, I don't even know, I don't even have a place to assemble something like that. So it's just, I always get so jealous of other photographers who can do things like this. Um, let's see. So this next piece, this next picture here is, oh, let's find it. Is we've got this. So this was just the sky, I guess, right? So you had just, this was the sky that you would kind of. Yes. I, I, I actually always replace the skies in all of my photos, like no matter what. Uh, even if I use the same sky, I try to separate it and then put put it on a different layer just to be able to balance the whole light in the picture a bit better. Yeah, I feel so, like skies are so easy to replace and you're not yeah. likely to go out and shoot one day and have an amazing, perfect sky. And so it's like you can always supplement, you know, augment your skies. And I think pe people don't do that enough. Yeah, I always try to shoot skies, and I when I need a sky, I always feel like I don't have enough. Uh, it's uh, yeah, as soon as I see a clear horizon, a quite clean horizon, I just try to shoot skies. It's always good, and they always look different. So I think that's very good. And then the next we've got just a few more, just sort of we've got like a, a cool bubble shot here. Yeah, that's actually my dad helping me out making some bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> so I find it, I found this recipe online how to make soap bubbles like that would be a little bit stronger and uh, so something uh, I don't remember what I put in there but it was some kind of chemical that I put in there to make it a little bit stronger that it wouldn't pop as fast. So otherwise it's just soap and water. When you were shooting these, let's see, maybe this, maybe it. Um... I don't know. When you were shooting... Oh, so it does. I actually do have some... Uh, <laughs> I actually do have some data here on that. So you were shooting this as a ISO 400 um, at f6.8 at a uh, 800th of a second. So yeah, so, yeah, something like that. I don't even remember. But yeah, I wanted to... I didn't want to have any movement in the bubbles, and I was shooting in natural light because I didn't want like this kind of artificial light of it. I just wanted to to capture the reflection of the of the surrounding there. So yeah, it's cool, and you can see the you can actually see the clouds and everything reflecting yeah. back. And was, when you did that cause you any troubles when you were doing um, when you were combining everything in Photoshop, having the um, um, this because this isn't, wasn't the same location, right? It was not the same location, but it was like it was mostly to get the sky and a little bit of the light of it. So uh, it was a little bit trickier than I thought. So, but I shot a lot of bubbles. I have I had like 200 shots of bubbles or something, <laughs> and they all looked a little bit different. I mean, here you don't see the reflection as much as in this one. So yeah. I was just I just picked the ones that I thought would work out the best, and and yeah, I went for those. And so they weren't the same location, but was it like the same time of day when you were? It was the same time of day, yeah. And it was a quite open location. You you saw a house in the reflection before, but it's it was like that was basically it around there. So it was like against a, a dark wall, so it would be easy to to separate it to just cut it out in Photoshop and put it, I think, on just blending mode screen or something. I thought it would work out, but then the background needs to be darker. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how I thought I would do it, and. Uh, I, uh, yeah, it, it was basically just shooting a lot of bubbles and, and picking the ones that I liked the most. And then we've got, these were just the, those were the, the bubble cans that you yeah back here. As, as you can see in the, in the original picture as well, I placed like a big thing there as well, so I would know, so where the grass would be covering it. So, I mean, the lower part of it was actually there, 
and then I just accelerate right the top of it. So you would, you'd put this little thing put right that there. there just to, because you have the grass in front of it, and I thought that it would be a little bit tricky to actually cut it out and put it there. So it would just be faster to actually put something there that I could that I could photograph. Yeah, it always helps to have like a little reference like that, even if yeah. you know what you're. And that's I guess where the plan comes in, where you go back to the sketch and you look to see, you know, that there will be a a, a, a canister right here, and mm -hmm. so you you actually kind of have a better idea when you do that. Yeah, yeah, it really helps. And then I guess the final behind the scenes picture too was was this was the was the little bubble. Thing yeah, I took some photos of, of this one as well, yeah, um, which is this kind of, yeah, what we now, I don't know what we call it, but bubble tool thing. And uh, yeah, I, I photographed it from some different angles and then I just placed it on top of the picture uh, and just just to see which one would fit the, the perspective the best. And you changed the color of it as well. Yeah, somehow it was a little bit too neon-ish, so I thought it would be... Just a little bit more, uh, like gray bluish would would fit it better. So it looks amazing. I mean, I'm looking at this, you know, at this view. I mean, it does. This doesn't look like a composite. It looks like she has a gigantic bubble thingy, and this looks this looks this looks real to me. So yeah, <laughs> very 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 well done. Um, but let's, so let's see. And now we've got, which is really cool too, is now we've kind of seen like the assets that you use to create it. Mm -hmm. um, you um, were willing to open this up in Photoshop and show everybody, um, you know, what it all looks like. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. Um, yes, I thought that I could show you a little bit like how it actually was made. And I haven't actually opened this since I worked on it. So let's see how it actually... I just opened it now and... and uh, you see it now here? Let's see. Yes. Great. So this is what the final one looked like. So let's see if I can just change the... I usually have two screens, so I have the layer panel, panel on a different screen, but here's the layer panel now in the, in the same, same screen. So it looks pretty good here, I guess, with the, with the folders and everything. And But if we open this up, you can see all the layers that I used to, to create this. And it's quite a lot of layers, I guess. I'm on my. Uh, I've I've got my laptop disconnected from my from my um, second screen, so I'm like mm -hmm. I'm looking at this on such a small screen and I can't read anything. I'm so sad. Um, All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I guess. I'm like, if you people see me zooming like in the corner of the screen, they see me like you know looking at. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, I guess shoot. I wish I could see. Can I zoom in on here anymore? Can I look at this little screen? What can I do? Make it bigger. Um, I don't know. Can you double click on it or somehow get into it. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I guess you can go ahead and just kind of show us from. I can I can tell you've got all the layers um, disabled right now except for what looks like the original sky. Just the sky. So I mean, what I would show you now would be just how it's built up in a like a layer way, I mean like the what's in the far back and then how it was built up, but it's not always the way it works when I when I build it up. I mean sometimes I usually would start to put it together quite roughly and just put the people where I thought the people would be and then put the sky and the horizon and everything quite roughly and then I would take it from there. But I think it's more logical to just show you the from the back yeah. how, it, how it was created or how I together. So it looks like you've got some the original clouds and then you kind of I did use the original clouds in the end, yeah. And uh, so this is what I started out with. I lightened the sky a bit. The, actually, what's below the horizon, you don't really have to care about. This is just for the sky. So I increased the contrast a little bit, made it a little bit more bluish. Uh, you use a lot of curves, it looks like. I do, yeah. And then I put uh, the people in there, and it looked something like this. So. It actually looked like this, and I cut out the people, so it would look like this. And at, for a long time, I wasn't really sure about the background. I, I was using this background that I already had here, uh, quite flat, big field, uh, but somehow it felt a little bit boring. Or like, I mean, where are they going on a flat field? I mean, there's like not really anywhere you can go. 
Yeah. So I found this background uh, that I shot from a mountain not so far from where I grew up on, actually. It's like just a 300 meter high mountain, so it's not really maybe even a mountain, but you have a really nice view from there. It was really super clear, fine day. Uh, so I took some pictures from up there, and that worked out perfectly as a background. Yeah, it looks. I mean, it it actually, if it, like if you, it makes such a difference that background versus the original. It like, it adds so much more depth, I think, to the scene. It does. Yeah, I was really like sometimes when you put something in there, you just see like, yeah, that's it. Now I got it. And sometimes you can't really put your finger on it. Why doesn't it really work out? Um, and I always keep my. Uh, I mean, as many layers as I can as smart objects, and actually as smart objects that I, not only as a smart object, but an object that I can enter in camera raw and change it if I want. Yeah. Because I'm that's that also something that, I mean, if you want to, if you need to change the exposure up and down, you need to change the color a little bit to make it all match up with it better, then it's always good to keep it as a, as a raw file, a raw layer, so you can actually go back and, and change the exposure, change the settings without actually affecting the, the content of the, of the, I mean, like not actually making the pixels worse. So on. Yeah, I love that feature. My biggest, my biggest complaint about it is the fact that when you open it up in camera raw and you've got a, and you're in a composite situation like this, yeah. that you can't, that you can't make the adjustments and then see what it looks like on your, on the, on the canvas. Um, so True. You, so that would be very helpful actually. Yeah. Yeah. That you could have the camera raw settings in a different window somehow. Uh, yeah. Like if you could just move it over and then that way you adjust your uh, exposure adjustments just a little bit and then you'd be able to see exactly what it looks like with the rest of the, with the canvas. So anyway, so Adobe for listening, guys, um, that would be awesome. Yeah, um, that would be great. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's uh, continue. What do we got? Um, I'm still on the on the foreground layer or the layer with the girls. So it was like it looked a little bit not. It was not blending t together perfectly. So I had to make it darker. I had to make it a little bit more. Ma I mean, matching the two different scenes, the background and the foreground. So you're do are you using curves to kind of dodge and burn a little bit? A little bit, yeah. I mean, what I use the most is, is basically U and saturation to, to saturate, to desaturate, and then I use curves for color adjustment. I'm, I'm using the different color channel. Uh, I mean, not for this one, but this is what I would use quite a lot, actually, uh, to adjust the color. Like, I mean, usually I can see, like, if I, it needs a tiny bit more blue, uh, then I just go into the blue channel and I just increase the blue a little bit. So, I mean, those are the adjustment layers I use all the time. I, I don't really use that many other ones. Yeah. yeah, I think it's funny, like, with all, with all the capabilities of Photoshop, and when you talk to um, talk to artists, so that, like, the, you know, like, the majority of things that they use the most are masks and layer, uh, adjustment layers. Yeah, it's really so much like, like that for me as well. I mean, I don't really use that many fancy functions in Photoshop. It's just... Basically, stacking layers on top of each other and, and using the layer masks and, and the adjustment layers to, to make it all blend together. Yeah. Um, then I had the, the bubble container on the left, uh, some lighting on it. Uh, filled it up with a little bit of bubbles, <laughs> a little bit of surface. I don't know how much you can see here. Uh, I put a ring in there. I actually because the ring was would be too small for the for the thing she's holding the shaft, so I thought that it would just be easier to um, to cut it out, uh, cut it. I mean, to separate it and and put the ring in there separately. So it was orange like this, and I just took the color down a bit, made it darker, more contrasty. Yeah, it looks so cool, and it and it, and it blends with the scene so much better. I think with that, it it, it you know. It, it kind of connects the the sky, you know, yeah. the sky to the to the to the grass. I was trying out some different colors, but somehow this felt like most. I don't know. It it felt best somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see what's next. Okay, I put some. I photographed some foam because I thought that it would be too the transi transition between the bubble and the and the thing would be too clean otherwise. Um, 
and here you can start to see the bubble coming. So it's actually not just one layer of bubble, so it's like several layers of bubble, it looks like. So there's different reflections that I photographed, and uh, let's see. When you do this, when you do work like this, and you, you <clears throat> do you, what do you think takes the longest? Do you think the the photography part takes the longest, or do you think the the Photoshop part takes the longest? I think it like if you do a good job when you photograph the stuff, it saves a lot of time in the, in the rest. Of, I mean, in the in the post production. Yeah. It's always like that. Every time I do something, it's like, oh, I should have done it this way, or I should have shot it without someone in there, so I would just have a clean background, or I would have something like this. So I learn something every time. I mean, it's it's not really a big deal, but it would save me a little bit of time. So every time I work on a new picture, I learn something. Mm -hmm. um, I put some bubbles in there, and actually in the original, <laughs> original version, I actually had some more bubbles. So I had like a bag floating around, uh -huh. I had actually another person. Uh, <laughs> I love the that. thing is that, to me, this was too, uh, it was too much, somehow. Yeah. And I just liked it like this, and you don't really know what would happen. Will it actually work, or, you know, you don't really know. So to me, that was more the way I wanted to do it. It so seems like one of those... I was struggling with for a long time. Should I have people in the bubbles, or no people in the bubbles? It's like sometimes it's one of those things where like you, you have an idea and you go with it and then you sit on it for like a couple of days and you think about it. And, uh, yeah. And it's really like that. So I was also like very concerned about like where should I place the bubble? Should, I, should it be here? Should it be here? Should it be here? Or should it be here? Yeah. That was also like something that I was... Yeah. So, but I somehow... Think, yeah, I think we placed it in a great spot okay. because I think it fills that... It adds a little bit of interest to that um, to that that right third of the screen. Exactly. I wanted it to be quite balanced, and I don't like following the the, the rule of thirds too much. And like, I mean, I, of course, it's good for composing, but like sometimes it's just good to to follow your feeling and just see how it goes. And usually, it would follow some kind of composition rule anyway. I think because that's how it feels right. I think so that's a lot of times like that. And it was actually the sun was coming out on the girls from the from the right, so I wanted to enhance that a little bit in the bubble as well. So I put a little bit of light in there as well on top of the bubble. Was it just you just tap it with the brush? Is that what that was? Or? It was actually I would think that this is actually. Uh, oh yeah, let's see. Let have a close. Let's have a closer look at this one. So what this is is actually flares that are that are photographed. Um, I, I basically, I have actually, just like I have a, a folder full of skies, I have a folder full of different flares. So I, I've been photographing lights and I've been photographing my studio lights and all kinds of stuff against black. So I would have like a whole bunch of different flares as well. Yeah, I think like, you know, good flares are so hard to find and there's, I've never seen a, um, a, 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 a generator um, that yeah, works as good. A little bit fake. And it's such an easy thing to, to just capture. So I think that's one of those things that everyone can do. Yeah. And when you just put it on screen, uh, it really looks great, I think. And you can make it smaller, you can turn it, and place it anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks awesome. They add yeah. so much to it. I think they, I think they kind of, lens flares kind of get a, a bad, have gotten a bad rap over the years. And, uh, yeah. But you know, it just depends on how you. Um, it depends on how how you use them, really. It does, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, in the end, it looked a little bit flat, I guess. So I mean, like I always do, I I put a little bit of my final adjustments to it. Sometimes I put a little bit of vignetting. I mean, that's somehow maybe not. That's something. Most photographers try to get rid of, but just sometimes it works really well to to put more focus on what's happening in the middle of the picture or like what you want to put the focus on. I have a black and white layer uh, set on soft light that would uh, on 25% just to increase the contrast a little bit. Uh, a curve layer that would also increase the contrast slightly. 
another black and white layer because somehow it was just too colorful to me. So I was I wanted to remove the color. I just wanted it to be a little bit fo more focused on the girl in the red dress and the rest to be a little bit more saturated. So as you can see in the mask here, I was actually not affecting the girl and yeah, the, the skin tones and, and the girls. I wanted to keep them like they were. So right now this is this is basically at this point in the in the um, uh, illustration that you have pretty much finished the compositing, but you're, this is your... Uh, yeah, some final adjustments. And I try to not apply this too early. I try to do it in the end because somehow, otherwise I need to... Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's just something I want to do as a final touch. Um, and what else? I put a little bit of color balance. I mean, just made it slightly more yellow, warmish in the in the... Highlights and slightly more bluish in the in the shadows. Uh, some of that works out really well. Gradient map with a little bit of like green yellow light somehow. I don't know. To me that that gave it a little bit more like magic touch. Uh, darken the sky slightly. Make make it slightly warmer in the middle. Do you use gradient uh, map a lot? Not really. Just like this once in a while. I, I can I can use it as I mean just to give it a touch of something. I mean, for example, if you would like it to have like a sunset feeling, uh, something that's pretty good then is to use the, the gradient map, put it on this one, which looks amazingly horrible right now. <laughs> but then if you just put it on soft light and take it down a little bit, you can get this kind of looks so cool sunsetish. Uh, light somehow, this warm light. So sometimes it could be good too, but I always use it on really like low, just like 10% or something. Mm -hmm. um, just as a final effect. And then just like a, a layer with, with some noise on top of it, just to make it uh, give it a little bit of I mean, not to look too perfect. A little bit of green. So without Let's see, without the final adjustments, it looks like this, quite flat, a little bit boring, I think, to me. Yeah. And the final adjustments like this. Yeah, it looks so much more dramatic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, it actually can set the mood pretty, pretty much somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's basically most of the time uh, what I do with, with the final adjustments is like increase the contrast slightly and just take down the colors a little bit. Yeah, I mean it look I mean it's it looks amazing that way and I mean thank you so much for like going through all this and showing everybody um, you know a, a bit about uh, about how you put these these composites together. Yeah, no worries. Um happy to show it. I hope someone gets to see, <laughs> sees it also. <laughs> so cool. Um, well, I think that is that's pretty much. Let's see what else do we have to talk about today. Uh, you know, oh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, like when you're shooting, what what kind of gear are you using? So what I'm using most of the time is, uh, uh, I'm I'm shooting with a. Before I was shooting with a Canon 5D Mark II, but for the past year I've been shooting with a Hasselblad H5D 40 megapixel camera, and. It's, I mean, it's a medium format camera. It's quite a lot more expensive, but to me, it actually is somehow a big difference. I don't know. Like, it's something with the, with the files. I just get more color and more information in the raw files, and the resolution is slightly higher, which is nice as well. But uh, I think to me, the biggest difference is somehow like the way it captures the colors. I don't know. I haven't been shooting with a D800, which is supposed to be a really good camera as well, but uh, I'm very happy with this camera. Yeah, um, and does your what is what is it you say? It's fifty megapixel. Uh, it's forty megapixels actually. So it's like seven thousand three hundred four uh, pixels wide and something five thousand high. And are you in the, what what kind of computer are you using? Uh, I'm using uh, I'm using a MacBook Book Pro uh, Retina MacBook for for shooting on location and uh, then for putting the pictures together I use a uh, home built. PC that I put together myself. Oh. Uh, two ISO screens, color edge screens, and uh, for light I use I have some Allen Chrome flashes uh, and some just like small Canon flashes. But most of the time I, I try to use natural light as much as I can. 
you know, in that in the, in the piece that we just looked at, you mostly used natural light, right? You didn't. It was actually natural light. I had some flash, uh, small flash with me, but um, but actually the sun was going down. It was like the summertime, and it was just going through the clouds a little bit and gave them a, little, a touch of light from the side, and it was just perfect. So I didn't need to use any light. Did you use any reflectors or anything like that? Yeah, sometimes reflectors as well, but but yeah, most of the time it's it's just natural. I mean, yeah, so, sometimes it could be good with a reflector too, but it depends a little bit on on the subject. And I just want it to look like I, I want it to look very simple, and I, I don't want the kind of studio look that some people seem to yeah. like. It's just a, I like the the natural light and just make it look like it was a snapshot, even though it it can consist of just hundreds of layers. Awesome, and thank you, thank you so much for sharing all that. I, I mean, I know it's like when you know for um, for photographers to like go into the Photoshop file, it's you know it's it's quite an intimate uh, <laughs> you know intimate thing to do. So yeah, don't don't mind the way I, I name the layers and everything. I think it's like mixed <laughs> Swedish English and stuff that I only understand myself. And <laughs> yeah, it, I, my layer, you know, listen, I, I preach that you should name your layers, but when I'm when I'm quickly throwing together or, or not maybe not even that quickly throwing together a piece, I, you know, my layer naming structure could definitely use some use some. Yeah, uh, to me it's more like I'm using the folders or the grouping. That that's like where I where I put the names, and then the layers within the group can just be called like layer 37 copy or something. <laughs> but um, so what are you working on? Anything else that's exciting that you're working on right now? Um, yeah, I'm actually working on uh, four new pictures at the moment. Or I two weeks ago I was in Sweden and I shot a lot of new material and uh, I'm uh, I don't know if I have anything of that that I can show you. I have some sketchbooks here. But it's uh, it would be Quite nice. I started working on two of those. It's starting to come together. Like this is very like. This is the last piece I did. Like, I don't know if you remember this one. It was like I a guy in between doors. So that's what the sketch looks like. And um, so the one I'm working on at the moment is basically a person. It's like out walking, and the world is falling down behind the person. Oh, it's cool. Like, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, so like as he's walking. Cool. This is a very very simple sketch, but I want it to look like just it's all falling down. And hopefully that picture will be published within the next few weeks. Um, hello. Hello, I'm here. Yeah, you, you hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah, what else? Yeah, I think. You will see within the, uh, within the next few weeks what what, what, I, what I'm. Well, that's to. amazing. I you know it's always it's all I'm always really excited when like you know I'm on Facebook or Twitter or something and I see one of your you know new piece you know it comes up and so it's always it's always really exciting to see to see what you've come up with next. Uh, it takes a lot of time, but my goal is to at least try to do ten pictures a year. But uh, yeah, it's sometimes it's hard because it's. Uh, it usually takes several weeks to, to just put it together, and uh, I mean it's not. It maybe takes like efficiently. It takes maybe 20 hours to put it together or something, 10 to 20 hours. But it has to take more time because I have to leave it for a while. And I have to come back to it, and yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you say almost maybe do like a new personal work like once once a once a month maybe? I try to do that, but like now it was a very busy year so far, and and uh, now I have a little bit more time, so I'm trying to do as much as possible. Yeah, people always say that you know the per, it's the the you know while it's nice to have the the client work that it's the personal work that gets you the clients. So yeah. it, it's it's the same uh, for me as well, and I think like a lot of photographers do personal work in the beginning, and then they get too busy to do it. But to me, it's always been really important to still do the personal work because that's Complete creative freedom, and I can do just whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I I completely agree. And I and I always say when I look through people's portfolios, it's always the personal work that 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 pop out to me the most. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, well, I think um, um, you know, we've taken a, enough of your time today, and I I certainly appreciate you coming out and and and. Uh, 
and this is like actually the first interview I've done on the new site, so I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be the first one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just really be, uh, more to come. And I'm I'm super excited about about um, about next to the text and and featuring uh, more of your work and talking to other artists like you as well. So, but anyway, yeah. well, thanks everybody, and thanks for tuning in. And uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, hope to see everyone again soon. Yeah, thanks for watching, and see you soon.